Hi, Robbie. Hey, Ari. Um, I'm interviewing you, but you're also interviewing me. Okay, well, I'd just like to say for, for anyone watching that I've been brought here against my will, and uh, anything I say is under duress, and therefore should be discounted. It, it's only because I promised him he could do the interview naked. <laughs> yeah. And he's really disappointed not to be naked. Yeah, yeah, because I'm a naturist by nature. Yeah. Naturist or naturalist? Well, the, I, I did provide you <laughs> a green environment to do. There's, there's a fair whack of nature here, yeah. yeah. So, uh, we met um, doing a film that is currently called The Song of Sway Lake. It might be called Sway Lake at the end of the day, or Sway, or it might be called Robbie's, Robbie's Naked Body. Great com. big bogus adventure. <laughs> um, and oh, I remember you said to me, On Sway Lake, which had a certain cadence to it. You know what I mean? That's an option too. Because the song of Sway Lake to me, uh, I suppose you, you know you, you always talked about how you wanted a dreamlike quality for the film. Yeah. And the song of Sway Lake kind of sounds almost like kind of some kind of story that you tell your kids or, but it sounds a bit twee as well. You know what I mean? It mm -hmm. Sounds a bit the song of Sway Lake. So you want you want to have something that's more like um, nine millimeter, nine millimeter Glock on Sway Lake to give it a more masculine yeah. energy. But just subtlety, you know, that's all I require from you, Larry, yeah. subtlety. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, on Sway Lake still has the dreamlike quality, but it sounds, um, it, it, it's, it sums up the experience of the film perfectly, I think, you know what I mean? I wanted to call Take the film, of I wanted to call the film Loonies, or Loons, because because there's a bird, there's a species there of bird a, yeah. that, that uh, live on the lake. And actually the song in the Song of Sway Lake does mention the loons. Really? But we were the loons on set. Exactly, um, this, is the, this is the perfect um, the transition. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, the film is uh, about uh, memory and obsession and um, beauty and youth and age. and. Um, <laughs> Robbie plays a, a Russian who becomes um, transfixed by a great American matriarch yeah. um, who represents everything that he wishes he could have in a bee. Yeah. Um, As he said at, w at one point in the script, Nikolai, my character, says, we were born at the wrong time. He has this, I think he's got this very romantic idea of this iconic age of America where you know, people people wore brill cream in their hair and swished around on speedboats yeah. and drank scotch. <laughs> you know, it's a very romantic idea of a of, a, of the fifties, really. But I think the, I think the, there's a lot of people in, in this country, but also around the world, who who are maybe smelling that America's greatest hour may have already passed. Because you, yeah, it's like ancient Rome. You know. You extend yourself too far, and then the the edges of the empire start to crumble. Yeah, that's exactly the same thing that's happening with the U.S. I think. Yeah, they stretch themselves much too far, militarily and all that other business, and now they're crumbling. And next is China. <laughs> they're going to crumble soon. So they should have Chinese subtitles on this because <laughs> that's really the, the nice thing uh, with your your take on the character he's somebody who's romantic about the past but also very f funny um, but this romance I, I see him as somewhere in between he sees himself as either a knight somewhere in between a knight and a court jester all at once and he's <laughs> he's coming to serve his queen mm. he wants to serve his queen he wants to um, deliver the dead enemies of the queen onto her doorstep yeah um, and he's confused ultimately about the difference between kind of romantic love and the traditional medieval sense where you, you know, the great knight would would uh, express devotion to the queen but not necessarily um, fuck the queen. Yeah, And yeah. he's confused about those differences, I think. Yeah. Do you think you're confused about those differences? Constantly, somewhere? yeah, constantly. I think you're const a you're romantic and you're a court jester all um, at once. Yeah, it's true. I mean, uh, I think with Nikolai as well, he um, 
he has this libidinous desire, this constant libidinous thing, you know, like almost like this sense of responsibility to fuck. Yeah. Not and something you can relate to at all. Never. No, no. Yeah. I'm <laughs> deeply monogamous as a human being. <laughs> but uh yeah, so, uh, and I think there's there's that there's that kind of that instinct in him, you know, that constant like I have to I have to be you know, I have to I have to be that kind of alpha male thing, and, you know, have sex with you. But then there's all this there's this this kind of love with the romantic age that mm-hmm. he's expressing in his loyalty towards Charlie in the script. Do you think there's anything, um, any kinship between being Irish and, and having a, playing a Russian character who has that um, sense of honor at the same time as a total recklessness? Well, I mean, uh, as regards similarities, I'd say there's a, there's a lot of similarities in the sense that there's a, there's a you know, the, the first few times you come to America, you realize what people mean when they say a European sensitivity or a European temperament or whatever. Uh, and I suppose Europeanness is not something I realized until, until I left Europe. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, Europe is a, is a it's, it's, it's like, you know, if you're from Europe, your your cultural identity goes way, way, way back, and it's kind of drenched in history, and it's drenched in war, and it's drenched in religion, and all that shit, you know. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a there's a similar sensibility in that regard, you know. Mm-hmm. Both uh, both nations ridiculously uh, kind of patriotic and stuff. But uh, much like Belgians. <laughs> yeah, the Belgians, on the other hand, are just twits, <laughs> twerps, all of them. Um, but no, uh, these uh, like I, I mean, I was quite surprised because I got sent the script, and then Ari sent me a nice letter saying, "I'd love you to come and play this part." And at first, I did think you're a lunatic because you're asking an <laughs> you're asking an Irish guy to come and play a Russian guy in a movie in America, and it seemed it seemed quite it seemed quite let's say stretched imaginative casting but you know what well you know I I I was looking for somebody who had a sparkle and uh, the character is inspired by somebody that I know who uh, who has a mixture of extreme romanticism and also um, destructive destructiveness and and humor and and, uh, that was the most important thing to find and and so you you have that, and you have that. Yeah. He also, Sergei, who you're talking about, he also has an incredible knowledge of uh, Russian military vehicles from through history. Like we were, t- we met in Brooklyn recently, myself and Sergei. And he goes, he goes, yes, and the uh, the the uh, the F four nine six P, which is a, a fighter jet from 1976, looks like a mosquito. You know this, you know this. <laughs> <laughs> to me, I sat there just kind of going. <laughs> Who the fuck do you think I am? <laughs> but uh, yeah, he's he's one of the most interesting individuals I've ever met, and it was a shame because the only before we made the film, uh, I'd only talked to him on Skype. I yeah. talked a fair whack, but, yeah. But I only met him recently. It was we enough so that up. I mean, I I remember sending him some of the rushes, and he was really impressed that you had kind of picked up the rhythm, picked up his rhythm, <laughs> you know. Um, and we're convincing. Yeah. Um, and some, you know, some people who don't know this kind of over-the-top Russian might think it's an exaggeration, but it's not an exaggeration <laughs> no. at all. No, no. <laughs> uh, no it's, it's, it's incredible. So, um, but you, you're you now an internationalist, uh, not just playing a Russian in America, but you you just produced or co-produced a movie in India. This is very I've true. Heard. You have you wanna, heard. Want to want to talk a little bit about let me elaborate. Into the producer's chair. Well, the old producer chair came to me because um, about two years ago, uh, this, this this these guys came to me and said, "Would you like to uh, be in this film? We haven't written the script yet, but we have written the treatment, and it's based on a section of a novel that was written in the 90s. And um, the section of the novel was written. It was, it was kind of mainly set in India, with a little bit." in the UK, it's about these two boys who are kind of running from, or have had to run from their homes uh, because they've gotten themselves in all sorts of trouble. So 
Uh, do you know the funny thing? At first, when they came to me, they kind of came to me through the agent, as is the normal way. I, I thought uh, that they were going to be like, you know, 18, 19 year old fledglings who mm -hmm. were trying to get something off the ground. And I thought, yeah, I'll go along to the meeting and I might learn something about about producing, but uh, I'm not going to hold out much hope. And then I got there and they were quite well seasoned producers who'd, who just thought, you know what, get an actor on who they want to help birth the whole uh, the whole script and help to cast and help to kind of you know just come up with the film from grassroots level so we me and the director and a couple of writers we all kind of co-wrote the script together which oh, really? was, yeah yeah there was many's a night spent kind of toiling in my kitchen <laughs> with that uh, with the director a guy called Charlie Belleville and and then we went we like scouted locations together in India mm -hmm. we cast it all together so it was like it was it's been quite a gratifying experience because it actually came off we actually got to go and make the film in India for four weeks and then back in London for like four or five days and now it's it's kind of in the edit yeah. and now the bit the producer bit where the first the first cut is kind of ready or nearing readiness I have to go in with like a pad and pen mm -hmm. and go and watch it as objectively as possible but that's that's impossible, especially if you're an actor and a show-off and uh, somewhat self-obsessed. <laughs> you can't watch a film objectively that you're in because you're just watching yourself constantly going, is that, is that alright? Yeah, I remember one of our, there was a scene we were doing on the film where one of the few times you kind of snapped at me on, on set, but I had set up the camera in such a way that it wasn't focused on you, it was sort of <laughs> the back of your head. <laughs> That's going to get. Oh, by the way. When you guys are done with the interview, you maybe take a couple more pictures just with my flash. Yeah. Just so I could. So I just don't want to use the flash while you guys are recording. Alright. But, um. Okay. Yeah, just. Because I want some eager light. Mm hmm. It's like really spotty with the leaves and stuff. Are we going, yeah? So, so tell us this, Ari Gold. Tell us this. Two two pronged question, right? First of all, why do you make films? Why is this the thing that you've decided to dedicate yourself to? And secondly, why this film? Because it's, I mean, it's a very it's it's the, the subject matter is incredibly niche and specific. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? I mean, well, uh, why, why I make films because for me it's um, it's the closest form of storytelling that allows you to go into a dream space and um, I tr I'm trying to figure out why for example I haven't tried to get into television for example but I, I don't I don't know that um, something about the lights going down mm. the traditional way of watching movies the lights go down and you go into this dream space and the stories that I want to tell though on the surface they're not necessarily um, advertising their spirituality I do think that there's an opportunity to kind of go into like the way the storytelling and going back all the way through human history whether it's like a, a, you, the tribe gathers the, the firelight is on and someone tells a story that is healing in some way to people yeah and I think a movie when when done right can in unconscious ways provide some kind of healing to the people who, who watch it and um, this story is very specific but any you know any story any good story I think is very specific to what it is and yet it touches on something universal and, yeah. and the movie is about you know three three characters on a lake going through this strange dance with each other um, but on a deeper level, all of them are connecting with the water, yeah. and the water represents life, and sex, and uh, fun, and summer, and in the winter it represents death, I and mean, when I say it represents, so the movie starts with somebody committing suicide mm. on the ice, and um, by engaging with the water, mm these people are trying to re-engage with life itself and um, so 
I can't say that there's a message exactly to the film, except it's, it's again, it, it, I don't think it's worth telling a story unless it provides something uh, healing mm. for the people watching it. And uh, maybe I'm traditionalist in that sense, but I do think there's a responsibility as a storyteller to to imagine that you're 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 with your tribe and you you have their attention for an hour and a half and the fire is glowing and you want to give them the right kind of dreams so that the next day they they feel better and they're better people. Yeah. So. I think the film from what I've seen of it is very dreamlike. You know. And I think originally the script had uh, uh, the the record that the guys were trying to find uh, was was anchored in 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 our reality, in the sense that it was by Cole Porter. Mm -hmm. Whereas now, the record itself is connected to the lake, and it is, I suppose, in many it's, it's a fictional record. Yeah. So that you know removes it once again from reality, and I like that. I think I think the film is very dreamy. Yeah. Yeah, and each each of the three main characters has a. A language of, of dreams and mm. you know your character has dreams Charlie the, the grandmother has dreams and Ollie your your friend the grandson has has mm. dreams and they all have a different flavor but each flavor is based on their relationship to to the water mm. Mm. Uh, you're above the water dreaming of the past dreaming of the the beauty that might have floated on the water the beautiful young Charlie floating on the water. Nice. Charlie's in the water, dreaming of her skinny dipping with her husband when she was 18. Yeah. And Ollie's dreaming of the ice because that's where his father died. And, and so all three are, all three of you are processing your your struggle to feel in the present through the way you relate to the water. Yeah. Wow. So maybe on Sway Lake is how you see the title because your character is on the surface of the lake. Yeah. Um, in Sway Lake would be Charlie and under Sway Lake would be Ollie. Um, under Sway Lake? Under Sway Lake is good. Although it starts with a U and one... Really we want something that starts with an A because when movie listings come up, they're alphabetical. So I was thinking we should call it Artvark. Fuck we call that! It, we call it Artvark Lake. It'll be first on on the list when you call it Abacus <laughs> Advantageous Abacus Lake. Good. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, well, this is profundity that I wasn't aware of. You know, before subconsciously this you will be aware when you see the movie. It's all yeah. it's all about how you feel the day after you see a movie. For me, my favorite movies. My favorite movie experiences are when I go to a movie by myself. Mm. I don't have to engage with anybody, but Which with is good, other people you don't in the audience. Have any friends? <laughs> so that's true. <laughs> so that's good. It's handy to um, enjoy that. And then you check in with yourself the next day and see what what's shifted. Yeah, I saw a movie recently in, in old Belgium, which which was nice because I, I did. I went on my own. Enjoyed it thoroughly. Enjoyed some of it. Didn't enjoy part of it. And then spent the next couple of days thinking about it. What movie? It was called Night Moves by Kelly Reichardt. Oh yeah, yeah another movie. Jesse Eisenberg. Sorry for you, sir. Yeah. Fucking hell. I think someone's looking for Ari. There are helicopters here. So. There's a lot of crime. It's a crime-ridden neighborhood. Um, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of bootlegging going on. So w what's next for you, Robert Sheehan? Any, any big plans? Well, there's a few bits and bobs. Uh, there's a film that I've been doing for the last five weeks in Belgium uh, called Moonwalk, which is about, it's about, it's about a guy, well, it's about the CIA, basically, who send like a specialist operative to London to find Stanley Kubrick in the 60s to persuade him to film a fake moon landing because the Apollo 11 is on its way to the, to the moon and they're not sure whether or not the transmission will work so they need to like film a backup mm -hmm. and then this, this CIA guy is like having a nervous breakdown at the time because he's just come from Nam right and so he gets conned by this this kind of wheeler dealer band manager guy who gets the, the budget money off him and thinks that's it and then basically long story short CIA guy, guy finds them, and then uh, uh, they have to they have to kind of make 
they have to make the moon landing with just with him and just like a bunch of hippies from the 60s who <laughs> just a bunch of lunatics because they've got no other choice uh, so it's this kind of madcap comedy all around that area of history mm -hmm. so I'm the guy who pretends to be Stanley Kubrick in order to get the money off of off of the CIA dude <laughs> yeah 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 and uh, yeah it's been great crack and I'm now in LA this is obviously shooting in LA and uh, the producers of Moonwalk have no idea that I'm here before <laughs> before we finish the film so uh, you know all going well and me making my flight it should be fine uh, hopefully but you can tell them you were here after you leave exactly yeah, yeah. Yeah. What's the harm? You know, they could probably still sue me, but they're a nice bunch. <laughs> did you go to the Stanley Kubrick exhibit at uh, the museum? I did actually, yeah. I went last year. Yeah. I went. I went uh, because I was, I, was, I was rehearsing for this other film where I play a guy with Tourette Syndrome. A film called The Road Within. Which is the reason I'm in LA, because it was, it was opening in the LA Film Festival, premiering there. So, um, so we went, myself and the director went to LACMA. The, the the place where the Stanley Kubrick exhibition was on, so that I could tick, I could have Tourette syndrome in public, and so I went see what there. It felt like. Yeah, yeah. And upstairs there was a Robert Maplethorpe um, exhibition going on of all these kind of very soft focus black and white images of like men with fists up other men's asses and stuff. <laughs> and in the middle of it, I was doing all the ticking. <laughs> I was going fuck, <laughs> right? <laughs> and uh, people just thought I was having an adverse reaction to, <laughs> to the pornography. But um, yeah, so so yeah, just, just, just various plates spinning in the air as per usual. Mm -hmm. What about you? You've been editing this movie for the last ten years now. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I I'm a perfectionist, but yeah, I, I'm the light is at the end of the tunnel, uh, and I'm writing two other things right now. Uh, one is set uh, in the future. I, I wouldn't exactly call it sci-fi, but um, it's more like um, what might happen two weeks from now if society were to fall apart. Mm. Um, but things are still hanging on by a thread. So that that's one thing I'm writing. And then uh, I still play my ukulele every now and then. <laughs> nice. <laughs> keep, uh, yeah, keep the old uh, ukulele abilities up to scratch. <laughs> Play the ukulele. I get some ukulele out for this. Ladies and gentlemen, this, this interview started off. Yeah, I will. Started off uh, about the film that me and Ari made, but now it has, has gone to. Ari's going to give us an example of what it is to play the ukulele. And I've seen him play the ukulele, and let me tell you, he's bloody brilliant on it. But da da ba ba ba. <laughs> yeah. So what are you gonna play? Will I know the lyrics? Um, um well. Long you know, you know, um, I want to be sedated, right? Yeah, that's well. Ba 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 ba. You know, I, feel, I feel sedated. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I've taken a sedative. What, what, what could you sing? I'm trying to think of something that, you know, I know lyrics. Give yeah. me like a... A jaunty tune? Yeah, give me some kind of classic and, you know, if I, if I run out of lyrics, I'll well, hold What I think you. is a classic, you know, may not be what you think is a classic. Yeah, we might, uh, we might come to a dissecting place. Little sir. Hmm. What's this? Little Shit. <laughs> Think about what I, I should do is I should be a bystander like you, the audience. Watch there. Ari do his thing. Here we thing. go. Little surfer, little one. Made my heart come all undone. Do you love me? Do you so? You could go. Little one. I don't know. I'll do the. I'll do the. I'll be one of the four Ready? seasons. 
My part again, sorry. Little one, little one. Little little We're the New Jersey boys. We, we are. Um, I've just been listening to a lot of Harry Nielsen. Do you know oh, what I mean, yeah. Harry Nielsen? Yeah. Everybody's talking at me. That song was written by a different gentleman named really? of, although he, he made it famous, but what was his name? Fred Neal, oh. who was a big supporter of dolphins. <laughs> I mean, he devoted his life to... I don't know what this interview is anymore. ...trying to save <laughs> dolphins. <laughs> oh, he was a wonderful gentleman. Um, and uh, uh, there you go. I, it, there's, another, there's another song on, on the best of Harry Nielsen album. Which is like a really well-known song, but I can't remember what it is now. I think like Mariah Carey did it. Um. <laughs> and cut. <laughs> How's that for an ending? Is that a good ending? Do we want to talk a bit more about the film before we do an ending? Do you know what I mean? Oh. Do we want to like cover a bit more of the? Because you're not going to use any of that, yeah? You, you, you might, you know, you might know. maybe intercut might <laughs> bits and pieces. You mean the stuff we talked about before? Uh, sh sure. You want to start? Are you running out of juice? Yeah. All right. Yeah, let's roll it again, I guess. It's so rolling. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> so, well, when I joined the team, the old Sway Lake team. Basically, uh, I got I flew to New York and got driven six and a half hours from New York City up to this up to this lovely kind of mansion house on a lake in the middle of nowhere, and only me and you had only ever spoken on Skype. Yeah, and we'd spoken quite a bit on Skype, and I'd 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 seen like on Skype I'd seen some of some of uh, some some of Ari's directorial methods coming through like. <laughs> We could say <laughs> at Such the time you were kind yeah, of you were, you were you were kind of trying to find out I suppose things in a mic in a kind of a Mike Lee way about your actors in a personal fashion. Was I getting too personal? Family or? life and stuff. Yeah. You're kind of going. So what in your life could you equate to this, right? <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we basically we kind of chatted a bit about our family lives and stuff, and then came and met you in this house. And we did like a week of rehearsal, and in that week, I think me and Mary Beth, who played Charlie, kind of kept saying to you, you know, we don't have to associate real <laughs> events in our lives with with things that happen in the script. Yeah. You know, we just got to rehearse the scenes, make them feel good. Mm -hmm. You know, but it was good because it was like a learning process. We were all just in the wilderness together. You know, we were just relieved because the septic tank had exploded. <laughs> <laughs> few days before the actors got there, and no, seriously, the whole the whole property was smelled like shit, like pretty bad, and we were panicked that we weren't going to get it cleaned up before the actors got there. Did you get it clean? You got it yeah. completely cleaned up. But the scene where you were scraping that big tilled yeah. area, where I'm com comparing Ollie's inability to really clean up the hedges to your cleaning up a huge. That whole area was the was, area that had been filled from it. Yes, exactly. It's human feces I'm, I'm raking in um, that scene. But uh, no, I think it was useful. It was useful for me anyway to know a little bit about mm. where the where the actors are coming from. I mean, I remember, you know, I, and I'm, it's a two-way street. We went for a long swim from one location to another location. Yeah, we did. Um, where we talked about uh, we talked about our families. We did. We were we were swimming through on the lake, uh, from essentially from one side of it to the other, yeah. and having a chat at the same time, which is not an easy task no. to be honest with you. And about halfway across, I did feel a sense of panic, and yeah. I went right. I'm not talking anymore. I have to concentrate on swimming, because uh, you know, had I failed, you would have had to drag me to the to the edge. Yeah, it would have been no easy task. Well, we sh we showed it was during a lunch break, and I remember we showed up half naked. We were always half naked. We were quite a lot we, half naked. I think yeah. we bonded because we both liked to. Strip amateur in, in public. Naturalists. 
Yeah. Um, but it, it was it was mad because we had we, we we would work six days of the week, and then we'd have one day off. And so on the Saturday night before our Sunday off, we'd all just go mad in the wilderness together and you know get pissed drunk and stuff. There was one morning I woke up on the dock, yeah, spooning someone. <laughs> And there was a, there was this kind of epic fog that descended right across over the lake, and I woke up like just <laughs> half naked on the dock. Where we're going, I'm not sure how I got here. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, we and were looking for that fog the whole the whole summer. I had had written a scene to take place at that fog, which sometimes will come at dawn, and uh, we finally got it. Yeah, I, and I was sending, even the days when. My schedule wouldn't have made this sane. I was setting my alarm for like 5.15 every morning. Every morning, 5.15, no matter if I'd gone to sleep 45 minutes before, I would get up and look to see if the fog was there. Mm. And if it, and when we finally got it, it was we had been shooting for 14, 16 hours, and ev everyone was released to go home and sleep. <laughs> and I was going down to go to sleep. Dawn was coming up, and I was like, oh, fuck, the fog has finally come. And so I called the second camera, and I was like, you have to, I'm sorry, I know you're in bed, please come back. What was her name again, second camera? Uh, she, remember we were like, oh, there's like seven of her. <laughs> you remember all that? Oh! She's gonna hate, she, if she ever sees We'll, we'll this, cut that part gonna, out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. She had like, Briggy or, or Debbie yeah. or, or, she was quite, she, she was quite attractive. She was. She had a certain androgynous quality about her. But well, it was useful because she could go to the, when we were shooting the aerial photography, she could go and get the guy who had the plane on mm. the lake. And she would go smile and say, can we shoot in your plane today? And he always said yes to her. It was a very, uh, he was a very eccentric man who had a beard that started like there, essentially. And it, it, it kind of it fell down his front like a blanket, like a bib. <laughs> and uh, he was wild. He was really proud of his plane and his speedboat, his Chris Craft speedboat. And uh, remember, he showed us like pictures of him and Tom Cruise together. Yeah. It's like it had been the highlight <laughs> of his adult life. When it was, I think he he was it that movie, The Firm. I think it was The Firm. Yeah. They shot around the lake. Yeah. But um, the whole thing, the whole thing for me, truly, you know. N we were talking about how the film is dreamlike. The, f the whole experience for me was was utterly dreamlike in a way because I suppose as an actor you get you get more opportunity to step outside yourself when you're when you when you go off to somewhere that's completely outside your comfort zone, mm -hmm. playing a character that's completely well not completely unlike me, but it's, it's but you know it was a completely different uh, expression, you know. Yeah. And so, so uh, it, the whole the whole thing just seemed like a departure from reality, for me. Yeah. You know, well, plus I was hounding around, and you know, you were hounding around. But uh, what was interesting, uh, mischief. <laughs> you know, you were you would joke that it was your practice movie because you were about to go shoot a movie <laughs> that actually had a budget. Yeah. Um, yeah. The which, mortal instruments. Which mortal instruments. Yeah. You, you. We actually moved our shoot. We had to start, I think, six days earlier than we intended to, mm. because you were going to go off and shoot that movie. That, Do that other thing, yeah. And, and because the practice movie got shoved into a new position, so we <laughs> scrambled to try to get the shoot going so that we could finish in time to release you to uh, your multi-million dollar oh, extravaganza. And we've all seen the benefits of that, <laughs> haven't we? We've all seen the benefit. Oh God, I tell you, I'm the new. <laughs> I tell you, I've, I've you're my, the new Robert Pattinson. Yeah, right? my oh my profile rocketed after that baby came out. Huh? I tell you that. Huh? Low battery. Um, but um. Well, there's another one in there for you. Keep yammering, but. Uh, and how was it? Uh, how how was it doing? A, I would love to hear about the contrast between working with, um, you know, someone like Rory Culkin who was cast and is like a polar opposite. You know, two friends who are very different from each other, mm. and then romancing his grandmother. Um, yeah. Talk about wh what that was like doing that over the course of your three and a half weeks on this practice movie. It was, uh, well, it was good practice, you know what I mean? <laughs> but um, 
it was interesting because of our, you know, our wildly differing energies, myself and Rory. You know, Rory has a very intriguing, very engaging uh, shyness, you know, that just emanates from him. I think mm -hmm. people people find Rory very intriguing, mm -hmm. you know, because because uh, I suppose to some extent, you know, to be candid about it, he 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 offers just just you know bits and bobs here and there you know as regards insight into the world into his reality and so people have a tendency to kind of to bridge the gap mm -hmm. but they bridge it in very exaggerated ways you know mm -hmm. so he so there's a certain you know kind of mythology that he's you know maybe inadvertently created for himself mm -hmm. and so but the thing is as well is that you know best friends do tend to be chalk and cheese you yeah. know and so it was it was at first, it was it was trying. To be honest with you, mm -hmm. it was a bit trying because, um, because I suppose my character, you know, I was I was always wanting more from him, even though you know he was just he was just being, you know, it was lovely, and I was kind of I was probably overcompensating because I was like, you know, come on, you know, we should all we should both we should both be kind of high energy, blah, blah, you know, and uh, but that's actually I mean the the amazing thing is that that is. That's true to the characters as well. Yeah. Is that you have a guy who, you know, this depressed kid whose father's just committed suicide and is naturally uh, shy. Yeah. Gravitates towards mm. someone who's like a wild lion, and mm. wild lion is constantly saying, "Get up, get yeah. up, get yeah. up, get up." Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it, it was great. It worked, and I mean, it was just it was lovely to let that whole relationship breathe, you know. Mm -hmm. And then all the stuff with Mary Beth. Who plays uh, Rory's character's grandmother? She plays Charlie, who kind of comes in. She's like this icon of a different age, you know. She's this very authoritative, matriarchal figure. Uh, was it was just like doing a play, you mm -hmm. know. All of the scenes we did just ran, you know. Yeah, well, ran well, long. Well, just that breathed. was a really great thing for me to be able to to just set the camera and let it run and it's such a pleasure as a director and you spend mm. so much time preparing something and then you get to this point and then you just hands off and you get to watch it <laughs> and that last scene where you guys dance together yeah I mean, that's one whole, of my fondest fucking memories you know man. the whole crew was totally transfixed and yeah. felt like we were watching we weren't meant to be there it mm. was like a private moment yeah. between you and Mary Beth and, and that you know to, that scene we would let it run for I think it was like four or five minutes. Yeah. Um, she, conversation and the dance. And she she took me by the hand, man, and she just she led me into that scene. Mm -hmm. You know, I was like a child, mm -hmm. and I just completely went with it. And she it was a testament to her. You know, her character completely takes the lead in that scene. Mm -hmm. And it was just it was beautiful. It was beautiful. I mean, I was. I mean, I think at one point I'm crying in that scene, and that was yeah. just completely yeah. natural. You know, I just burst into tears. I think I've been <coughs> re reduced to an infant. <coughs> Bless you. But uh, yeah, so that was all. That was all profoundly enjoyable. You know, I mean, I was reading a, an actor who was doing an interview recently, and he was saying, great actor, Irish actor called Killian Murphy, who was saying how the great thing about theatre is that. If in a run of doing a play for say three months, if you get a handful of moments where you've utterly transcended time, space, everything, the fact that it's a contrived experience where there's an audience and a stage, you know, if you as an actor can completely forget about all that stuff and just just be in the ether of the moment, then that's worth it. You know, that's mm -hmm. worth 20 years of practice, and uh, I kind of feel like that was one of those moments. It, it felt like it from, from the outside watching and filming it, it, it felt like b both of you went somewhere else. You went, in, you went into the life force, you went into the, you went into the water as it were. I mean, yeah. that, that Even though that scene wasn't on the water, it, it felt like you, 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 touched, you touched the life force. And that's, that's why I'm, beautiful. you know, and bear in mind, we're, all, we're talking about this, but this was two years ago, wasn't it? Mm, now. Almost, yeah. Two years ago. Was that all? Yeah, it's two. Years. It feels like longer because, of course, you know we've we've gone away. We've done different stuff. Whole whole life shit has happened in the meantime. So I'm so fucking intrigued to see this film from start to finish yeah. with all bells and whistles, music, everything done. Yeah, I've seen Soon. snippets here and there through ADR. Soon. 
Yeah, man. I can't fuck away. And you know, the thing is, we called the practice film <laughs> because after the, uh, went off and did the studio film afterwards. But, you know, a film like this, I'm much more intrigued to see than, than, than something like some kind of big budget studio effort because, because you've got a much more emotional investment in something like this, you know? And you obviously have a huge emotional investment in this. I mean, this has yeah. essentially been your life yeah. for the last three years, and so uh, it's it's going to be it's going to be like I've, I, this has been the longest from doing a project to a project Just coming out. It. Yeah, you know, it better I'm, be I'm fucking not, good. Yeah, <laughs> it will be. Yeah, yeah, man. All right, should we sign off? Signing off. Yeah. May the force See be you with all you. The movies. Remember to go to a dark place. Go to a dark place and, and enter a dream. Also, cheese neck with plants. Cheese doesn't affect your dreams. That's a myth. But, but pepper, hot pepper, really fucks with your dreams. Makes them really vivid. And uh, you know, in India, the hot red pepper has been used as weapons in some of the Bollywood movies. So have, now that you're making movies in India, yeah, just remember that you can go. Like nice. this with red pepper, and you can scare off the enemies. <laughs> Next time yeah. you're doing an action movie in India, or just Amitabh Bachchan does that in the movie. Does he? Yeah. Of course he does. Yeah. He makes about forty a year. Yeah. Do you know in in India they call the actors they call the movie stars taxi actors, because let's say if Amitabh Bachchan is in Mumbai, he could be doing three films at the exact same on the exact same day. So he's yeah. like he gets out of a taxi at one side of the city. <laughs> joins a previously choreographed scene, you know, does like a 10 minute long take, one take, get back in the taxi, drive across town, do another film, and just carry on like that. But yeah, I highly recommend you shoot in India, man. People people to. swear you off it, but but we found we found a lovely little pocket of India that, that just was completely controlled and paradise, man. Goa. Go to Goa, people.